I invite you all to stand as you are able and remain standing through the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty God, your never-ending love for your people stretches from the farthest horizon to the dimmest star sparkling in the night sky. As we gather together to celebrate the life of our colleague and friend, George Abbey, we ask that you wrap him in your tender care and in your boundless compassion, console us who mourn so that we may see the gate to eternal life. All this we pray in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Young and all, for such an uplifting invocation. I'm Vanessa Weich, Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, and I'd like to welcome you all here today as we pay tribute to George W.S. Abbey, the seventh director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. Joining us today are his five children, George Abbey Jr., Joyce Abbey, Suzanne Fair, James Abbey, and Andrew Abbey, along with their families, including seven grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, extended family, as well as friends and colleagues. We are also honored to have with us today NASA Associate Administrator Jim Pree, Deputy Associate Administrator Casey Swales, Space Operations Associate Director Ken Bowersox, and Deputy Associate Joel Montabano, former NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, former NASA Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, and former Johnson Director Mike Coates. 
along with the Russian cons Consulate General, Alexei Markov. Thank you for being with us. Additionally, we have representatives from federal and state government here with us today, and we want to thank you for your bipartisan support. Uh, from Texas, we have Texas State Representative Paul with us, and we have staffers for Senators Cornyn and Cruz, and we have staffers for Representatives Jackson Lee, Babber, Webin, Weber, Fletcher, and Garcia. And we have staffers from State Senator Middleton and State Representative Bonin. Mr. Abbey was a legendary figure in human spaceflight. He was a true visionary and a transformational leader whose legacy continues to influence many facets of our work, notably astronaut selection and flight operations. He was also a friend and mentor to many here at Johnson and across the agency. He became Johnson Space Center's seventh director in January of 1996. Before assuming this role, he faithfully served NASA for 37 years in a variety of critical roles. In 1964, he began his spaceflight career as an Air Force officer detailed to the Manned Spacecraft Center, now Johnson Space Center. He then was technical assistant to the Apollo Spacecraft Program Manager, George Lowe, where he supported the Apollo 1 accident investigation and was a leader in developing and implementing critical safety improvements required to resume Apollo flights. He later served at the, as the center director's technical assistant. Um, those uh, in that time were affectionately known as Bubba's. George was named director of flight operations in the height of the anticipation of the first space shuttle flight. In addition to the early operational flights of the shuttle program, he was responsible for astronaut training and development, as well as mission operations support for the new program's approach and landing tests and orbital flight tests. Affectionately known as the father of modern spaceflight, he led the selection of a new generation of explorers, including the first female and minority astronauts in 1978. In 1985, he became director of the newly formed Flight Crew Operations Directorate, which managed NASA's crews and the center's aircraft operations office. After a tour in Washington at NASA headquarters and an assignment with the National Space Council, he returned to Houston as Johnson Center Director. During his time in this role, the space shuttle flew more than 25 successful missions, and his leadership was instrumental in completion of the joint U.S. and Russian Shuttle Mir program, providing important information for long-duration spaceflight and encouraging international participation within the space station, within the space program. The Johnson team joked that George's leadership and determination willed the International Space Station into orbit during a time of spaceflight challenges. Many of you may remember the Saturday, what we called gassers, with, that he led in order for us to complete the activities. Of course, we're very proud of the International Space Station. That platform just celebrated 25 years of continuous spaceflight in 2023. And at this time, we have currently on board nine astronauts and cosmonauts. George was just as concerned with the community here on Earth as he was with the far reaches of space. He launched the Longhorn Project, giving local students the opportunity to learn about animal husbandry, aquaculture, agriculture, and fruit and vegetable cultivation. The project cemented relationships with the Clear Creek Independent School District, uh, along with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, and with the local Go Texan Committee, and the Texas Longhorn Breeders Association. We are very proud of our Longhorn Project, and uh, the students uh, this year, many of you may not be aware, but they were winners of Best in Show and uh, First Place. George officially retired from the agency in 2003 
after serving as Senior Assistant for International Issues at NASA Headquarters. He then served as a Senior Fellow in Space Policy at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. The NASA family feels George's ab absence so acutely, as he was present at many of our greatest achievements and helped guide us through our toughest challenges. He was in mission control when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. He aided in establishing the United States partnership with Russia on space exploration, and he helped uh, engineer the safe return of the Apollo 13 crew after an explosion debilitated the spacecraft. George and the Apollo 13 operations team received the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award from President Richard Nixon. And personally, I will share that Mr. Abbey was a constant figure uh, here supporting us at the Johnson Space Center. He was always present and available and I will certainly miss uh, seeing him at all of the memorials that we have. He was always here, could always look out into the crowd and see him and know that he was there for us. In December 2021, the Johnson Space Center renamed the park outside the main gate as the George W.S. Abbey Rocket Park to recognize the role and impact he's made on the nation's space exploration program. As the NASA family mourns George's passing, we're grateful for his leadership and his legacy that he leaves behind. On today's program, you're gonna hear remarks from Mr. Jay Honeycutt, from Captain Jim Weatherby, and from James Abbey. But first, let's hear a message from the International Space Station that will be sent down. I'm NASA astronaut Mike Barrett, currently flying aboard the International Space Station. On behalf of the NASA crew office, I want to take a moment to pay tribute to the late George Abbey. Mr. Abbey was a visionary who paved so many roads on the journey of human spaceflight. He was a titan within NASA and a true pioneer who made the work we do today possible, including building this magnificent multinational station and enabling future human exploration to the moon and beyond. Spanning from Apollo to the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station programs, Mr. Abbey will always be revered as one of the agency's most influential leaders. He worked tirelessly for more diversity in human spaceflight, including the selection of the 1978 NASA astronaut class that included the first female and minority spacefarers. He helped launch a new era of space exploration with the development and launch of the first elements of the space station and did so enabled by his personal and foundational relationships with international partners. And of course, we cannot forget his love for the community. He was a cultural icon at Johnson Space Center, and we have him to thank for the annual Chili Cook-Off and the Longhorn Projects. To Mr. Abbey, thank you for all you've done to benefit humanity. Your DNA runs deep in the human spaceflight community. Godspeed, George. Uh, well, thank you, uh, family and Vanessa, for uh, giving me this opportunity today to speak with uh, about George Abbey, a great American. There are generally three ways people got to know, or three types of people that got to know George. There were those who kind of worked in the organization uh, that he was responsible for. They knew who he was, what he did, maybe where he sat. Uh, but they didn't have any direct uh, communication or interface with him. The second group either worked directly for him or at least had multiple opportunities to interface with him, if not on a daily basis, at least uh, routinely. What this group saw was a man of amazing intellect, a man with a memory of an encyclopedia, a man with a get it done attitude second to none, and a man unafraid to make difficult uh, decisions as they were needed and not after long periods of study or indecision. I'll discuss the third group in a minute, but first his technical achievements have been spoken to already, but some are definitely stand out. He was instrumental in establishing a strong positive technical relationship with the Russians during Apollo Soyuz and that relationship 
has been maintained throughout Shuttle, Shuttle Mir, the Russian space station, and the internet, current International Space Station. He continued to be active with the Russians during his, class, during his days down at Rice Institute, where he sponsored an annual joint U.S.-Russia International Space Station Biomedical Conference to discuss common issues and concerns re related to human spaceflight. He refocused the culture of the astronaut office and en enabled its growth by creating duties defined by, the or by their contribution to mission success in the areas of space, space, earth science, biomedical research, and other scientific pursuits. His expertise in flight crew selection resulted in shuttle and ISS crews who consistently exhibited ex expectations beyond, uh, beyond their, uh, or expectations beyond what they we wanted out of their flights. After tour in Washington, he returned here as, as the director and among other duties, he took over personal direction of the development of the International Space Station. ISS had significant issues at the time and the elements of various stages of development with no consistent performance by the various elements. So George held meetings every Saturday morning with a required attendance of all project program managers and in some cases, corporate CEOs to discuss program status, milestones, and critical issues. The, these meetings generated their own NASA acronym. They were called GASSERS, or George's, George Abbey's Saturday Review, and you better be there. George was also a great mentor. Two examples of him are here on the stage today. I could name a former NASA Administrator Aerospace CEO, three NASA Center Directors and a Shuttle Program Manager, who benefited directly from his mentorship. George was a great gift giver. If you ever got a gift from George at Christmas or on your birthday, you could tell that he put a lot of thought into it and it was very appropriate for the, for the occasion. He was very, very caring. If you were George's friend, you were his friend no matter what. He kept up with everyone. I remember when Cheryl or Mary used to put stacks of yellow phone messages on his desk almost every day. In there would be business relations related issues or maybe half of them. The other half were friends that were returning his call or he was call, calling to check on them. My final memory of George is a very personal one. Several years ago, I was at Methodist Hospital at the medical center with a very serious medical condition in there for over a month. George was at Rice at the time. <clears throat> and every day as he was leaving Rice for the day, he would stop by my hotel room, my hospital room, to check on me. If it was on a weekend or he was out of town, he'd, he would call. I love the man very and miss him very terribly, and may God rest his soul. Thank you. When the station passes overhead, I look to the heavens and I see the leader who brought us continuous human presence in space, Mr. George W. S. Abbey. With his systematic management process that fostered disciplined decision-making, he inspired elite teams to create superb space vehicles. Mr. Abbey was technically brilliant, and in 20 years, I never saw him forget anything. But as stellar as he was on the technical side, his greatest strength may have been on the social side. He understood people better than anyone. We know it takes technical brilliance to send people to the moon, but it takes a deep understanding of the social side to bring teams together and return the astronauts safely after their vehicle explodes on the way to the moon. Great leaders who are successful in dangerous endeavors display three common characteristics that distinguish them from other leaders, commitment, caring, and competence. Among leaders, Mr. Ebby was the exemplar. First, commitment. He was intensely committed to the NASA mission. Human spaceflight was his passion. He learned from the best. Dr. Lowe and Mr. Ebby restored NASA's culture of operating excellence after the tragic Apollo fire, and they got us to the moon. 
20 years later, Mr. Abbey was the singular force creating and nurturing the operating culture at NASA. Mr. Abbey's ascent to the top of human spaceflight was launched in 1986 as a result of a recommendation by the Rogers Commission, which read in part, the function of the flight crew operations director should be elevated in the NASA organization structure. <coughs> Months later, to demonstrate compliance, Bill Shepard and Mike McCulley elevated Mr. Abbey's desk on the top of four cinder blocks. <laughs> he kept this stand-up configuration similar to Winston Churchill's desk as a personal reminder of his immense responsibility to restore operating excellence at NASA. Mr. Abbey acknowledged the exceptional mentoring from Bob Gilruth, the legendary Chris Kraft, and he cited Yuri Glaskov from Russia as another mentor. He humbly admitted that any success he had came from them and from two brilliant engineers, Dr. Max Faget and Captain John Young. Mr. Abbey understood our mission, but he changed the definition. We were to fly only when ready and with operating excellence. Human destiny is to explore space, but we don't need to explore space on Tuesday. We can explore space on Saturday after we have fixed all of our problems. As director of flight for operations, when I reported success stories to Mr. Abbey, he often appeared uninterested. When I reported issues, problems, or challenges, his face lit up with engagement. Even if I didn't have a proposed solution or a suggestion, he was genuinely satisfied that at least I had identified an issue. Searching for vulnerabilities is necessary in our dangerous world. To Mr. Abbey, the only value in a sunshine report was knowing I wasn't looking hard enough for vulnerabilities. The station and shuttle programs worked best under George Abbey. He listened to anyone who had concerns. When managers or engineers said go, he asked insightful questions to understand why they were so confident. He challenged the go recommendations more than the no-goes. Yet his conservative philosophy didn't slow us down, it made us better. He inspired operating excellence. We had the highest flight rate under his tenure and every flight was successful. The second characteristics of great operating leaders is caring. These leaders care deeply for their people, and not only because they are contributing to the mission. Mr. Abbey took immense satisfaction from seeing people actualize their greatest potential. My wife and the families of other crew members can attest to how much Mr. Abbey cared for each of them. Thirdly, operating leaders who are successful are intensely competent. They possess a true mastery of their craft. Mr. Abbey followed guiding principles. His work ethic was legendary. After we concluded an intense two-month effort on a multi-billion dollar contract for the station, I expected a huge celebration. Rather, Mr. Abbey went back to his inbox. In his mind, all issues were potentially critical for human spaceflight. Another principle was responsibility. One of his favorite quotes came from Admiral Rickover. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden to someone else. He taught us the principles of accountability, assurance, oversight, and integration. His outreach to the community was legendary and inspiring, as evidenced by his passion for the education of students and the Longhorn facility. In the spirit of Mr. Abbey, I want to make these recommendations to you here at JSC and the wider NASA and the commercial space companies. Take us back to the moon and on to Mars. Do this with the inspiration of Mr. Abbey. Embody and enact his values. Follow his principles. Be stellar leaders in your dangerous endeavors. Demonstrate commitment, care, and competence. Embrace accountability and create assurance. Provide the integration function that will ensure all space missions are conducted properly and inspire elite teams that will take humanity to the stars. Mr. Abbey has given me so much over 40 years and he continues to provide sage guidance and inspiration. When I have a difficult decision, I just think about what would George do? He shows me the way. It may be the tougher choice, but it's always what he would have done. George, I hope you are continuing your mission of exploring God's beautiful universe. I cherish the times I was your deputy, 
your technical assistant, confidant, and friend. I especially love seeing how much you cared for the people who are committed to our noble mission of sending humans into space. Thank you, Mr. Abbey, and Godspeed. I'm James Abbey. Um, I'd like to thank the NASA family for sharing our father with us and allowing us to participate today. Um, you knew him as Mr. Abbey. We knew him as dad, father, grandpa, grampy, and dedushka. Um, he also had a pension, if you didn't know this. Besides safety, he was a very uh, poetic man, and he enjoyed poems quite a bit. So. I chose this poem specifically for him because I think it epitomizes who he is and what he did. The poem is by James Whitcomb Riley, titled A Good Man. A good man never dies in worthy deed and prayer, in helpful hands and honest eyes, if smiles or tears be there, who lives for you and me, lives for the world he tries, to help he lives eternally, a good man never dies who lives to bravely take his share of toil and stress, and to his weaker fellow's sake makes every burden less. He may at last seem worn, life fallen, hands and eyes folded yet. Though we mourn and mourn, a good man never dies. I remember the first time I really saw an airplane up close was when one of my older brothers took me out to Bowling Field. I was just very enthused about aviation. In the Navy, we of course got a pretty good indoctrination into ships and also into aviation. So actually, 30% of my class went into the Air Force. We could go right to flight training. I didn't want to spend a career on the ship. I wanted to fly. Uh, when I got out of graduate school, I was assigned to the Dinosaur Program Office, so I was responsible for all the avionics on the uh, dinosaur, communications, the guidance and navigation, and all the electronics. That was an unfortunate decision when they canceled. A lot of the systems on Dinosaur carried over to the Space Shuttle. During the Gemini time, I was working on the Apollo program. I got assigned working with the command module and service module and the lunar module. I can remember the tension and the excitement at the, uh, each of the Apollo missions because you had to have everything work and work well, and each of the Apollo missions was uh, unique in itself. It had its own set of problems. You could make a movie about each flight. We got into the shuttle era. We were flying not just pilots to fly the vehicle, but you were flying mission specialists who would operate the experiments and do the tests on the mission, the EVAs, and the other activities that were involved in the mission. So you immediately opened it up for a larger group of people, and both John and I uh, worked very closely together on the selection of the crews, and uh, for the crews we did select, I think it all turned out well. Well, I think uh, each mission, with the, we spending the time with the crew uh, as they get ready to go, go, go launch, those are special moments and special uh, memories. And the uh, end of a successful mission is a uh, time you look forward to. And when it comes, you get a, a good feeling. You would like to have a capability to take your astronauts into space. And over and above that, you'd like to have a capability of assembling large structures in space. The shuttle gave us that capability. We were able to build a space station because we had the shuttle. Well, I think the, as you look at the purpose of the space station, it's really a laboratory for learning to work in space for long durations. Trying to solve those answers is not just an issue for one country, it's an issue for all those that were participating in human spaceflight, so it's an international activity. Well, I think uh, the next logical step is going back to the moon. and. Uh, you can learn an awful lot about living and working in space uh, beyond Earth orbit on the moon, and that's a good training ground for the going beyond. I came to 
really uh, appreciate uh, this center and love the center, love working here, and uh, as the finest people in the world. And in addition to that, we're uh, blessed with a great community here. But if I was successful in anything I did, it was because of the people, the leaders that mentored me and uh, also have the opportunity to work with some very wonderful and outstanding people and uh, have some wonderful and outstanding people work for me. So if I was really successful in anything I, I've done over the years, it really was because of those people, not because of me. I would like to um, ask for all of us to thank the Abbey family for sharing their dad, their grandpa with us. We really thank you. Mr. Abbey uh, gave so much to the agency and we want to salute you. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us for the memorial here in the Teague. Uh, we ask that you please uh, join us uh, at the Astronaut Grove for the tree dedication. Uh, there are buses that are staged in front of Building 1 to take guests uh, to the Grove and we'll also bring you back. So please, uh, as we leave, uh, file out and join us uh, and we will reconvene over at the Astronaut Grove. Thank you.